Oh my goodness. That's a really interesting challenge and I don't have a ready-made answer. Uh, I think it's the policies that I can picture now seem to be adequate and it's more what are people going to be doing with the, the internet and how much I think there is to improve in the way that it can be used in the sort of social network aspect of how collectively that that's been my pursuit all through the years is the collective ability to, for humans to understand and cope with complex, urgent problems. And uh, that hasn't specifically been picked up very much. And I think that there are procedures and strategies that could really start gaining way in that. Well, I, I have a concept I call a dynamic knowledge repository that's both a technology thing, how you hold it and all the tools it has to work on it, but also all the conventions and processes and skills it takes to gather all the information that's available on a given complex knowledge problem and then integrate it such that, that if there are any inconsistencies, they're very clear to people. If there are issues that aren't yet resolved, that's clear to people. If an issue has been resolved, it's clear where it is and what new knowledge and new were there. And it'd be something too that has a lot of facilitation for people to learn from it. And it's not assuming that it's just you sit there and can get taught. It's assuming that there are new skills that you can develop for going after your own understanding better. So there's a lot of technology and new skills and processes and conventions, etc. involved. But going after that, which I call that dynamic knowledge repository, I think is a very, very key focus, and very important. I guess I've been working so much on thinking about the positive potentials that I haven't, but you know, I, I guess there are many ways in which despots and so on can take control or who knows what else? Well, it, it is interesting to consider what can be done with ever smarter computers. And I've always pushed that sort of to the side and say, okay, when it gets there so that you can depend upon the things that they can intelligently assess and clarify for you, great. But in the meantime, there's a lot to do about what people can do. And uh, so there are, there are things, for instance, I feel have been neglected. And it's kind of part of what I call a, uh, well, the paradigms that people have had. And so there's so much glued to the way you learn is by looking at a page of a book. And so that was a model and all the computer tools that are brought forward and you scan them and such, you know, scroll thing. But what I thought is, oh, there's a new means by which you can look at them. The computer screen does not have to emulate a page of a book, even though that's been anchored in for these years. So we start out by saying, well, let me see. Suppose I want to see only the first line of every paragraph. That's great. That's a paragraph I want to open up. So that started with that kind of viewing options, and then there are more and more. And there are viewing options that uh, can help you and you see the structure of things and get it. And that I've learned, learned more and more about part of the human equipment that they call a perceptual machinery. And realizing that, that that's what, like the sound of my words are hitting you, but there's not noise that hits you. That perceptual machinery takes that audio stimulus that comes to your ear and converts it not just to words but to a flow of meaning. And that machinery is there, it's been there since way before we did spoken languages I guess, but that's how we could then speak. And the same thing then optically when you get the stimulus there, oh, a flow of words, not just a string of characters that represent vowels and consonants, you know, it just flows to you. So that machinery is there and can be trained to do many other kind of things that a computer can give you visually and audially, stuff like this. 
new stimuli that can really do much more comprehensive job of providing the flow of information to you. So we have to kind of get past that burnt paradigm of a book. Well, look out. <laughs> it's, uh, how would you tell a non-technical person 110 years ago about what the automobiles were going to do? You know, you described the vehicle and such like this, but for almost anybody, whether they were technical or not, by the time you got to telling them about how everybody has a car, the garages they have, the way drives away in the home are, oh, the streets, the parking regulations and the, and the street and control and stoplights and, and stop signs and all of the conventions and that you're coming to a stop street and four people are there like this, there's a procedure you follow about who gets to take the next turn. And you watch everybody automatically doing it. And they look at you and just couldn't imagine a world like that. So that's, that's, all those things are going to go up in the way in which we deal with these new technologies too. is a dichotomy. So there's an increasing chance because of the complexity and urgency in the world that human society can crash. But there's an increasing chance that if we get smart about how we get collectively smarter to understand and be able to cope, we'll make it better. But just take global warming, for instance. You know, we could seriously crash and probably just the economic problem of trying to cope with it is something that who knows how we're going to deal with it. But 